Can we give him a big welcome? Revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Action. Now. Action. Now. Action. Now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Comrade Chairman Alex Nyako, Comrade Secretary General Dr. Yaoba, Executives and Officials of the Ghana Trade Union Congress, our National Chairman of the National Democratic Congress, General Secretary of NDC, my brothers and sisters from both the TUC and NDC, I want to thank you for this warm welcome into the Hall of Congress of the TUC and to thank you for the warm welcome we have received and the solidarity that I have seen expressed here today. Let me thank you for the first copy of the Workers' Manifesto and I can assure you that we will study it very carefully and incorporate the relevant provisions into the People's Manifesto. <laughs> From the Workers' Manifesto into the People's Manifesto. Today we've gathered here as a family to cement the relationship between the TUC and the NDC in our shared desire to build the Ghana we want together. As social democrats, we believe in social justice and equity, and we share a common objective with organized labor represented by the Trade Union Congress. We both prioritize the welfare and well-being of the working class and ordinary people. This shared goal requires us to cooperate and collaborate to ensure the total achievement of our objectives. And as I've always said, the NDC and the TUC are allies. The history of global development shows that trade unions have been instrumental in shaping economies to promote universal human well-being. The progress made in the Western world and other advanced economies is a testament to the tenacity and resilience of workers' unions. I believe that today's interaction will mark the beginning of even deeper relations to safeguard our common interests and ensure a better future for the working people of our country. Just as no economy can survive without prioritizing the well-being of its workers, we as Social Democrats recognize the need to design policies that accommodate the growth of industry and business and at the same time protect the interests of workers and their unions. <laughs> the NDC, which I lead, recognizes that it does not have a monopoly on ideas and that it takes a cross-fertilization of ideas to achieve and sustain the economic progress of our country. And we acknowledge the pool of ideas and expertise at the disposal of the TUC and recognize that you have clear perspectives of the challenges confronting our country in this era, as evidenced in your Workers' Manifesto. As allies whose anchor ideology is social democracy, the NDC has no hesitation in inviting the TUC to actively participate in our strategy formulation processes so that the concerns of the working class and vulnerable 
can be adequately reflected in policy whenever we take over the reins of government. <laughs> Comrades and friends, no political party in Ghana is better aligned to pursue policies favorable to the working class than the National Democratic Congress. We firmly and openly ascribe to the tenets of social democracy, believing that the state and the market can work together to ensure economic expansion and equitable sharing of the fruits of economic growth. We understand that our collective well-being as citizens resides in sustained economic growth through high productivity in sectors where we have a comparative advantage. We therefore welcome any opportunity to engage organized labor in the pursuit of these objectives continuously. Therefore, I wish to thank Brother Secretary General and your team for the opportunity to dialogue with you today and Frederick Ebert Foundation for the platform it has created for the two of us to engage. Comrade Secretary General, our beloved country has been hit very hard by harsh economic conditions over the last couple of years. Under this current administration, Ghana has witnessed severe adverse effects due to what we in the NDC and many Ghanaians consider a self-inflicted economic crisis. The high inflation rate, high cost of living, destruction of jobs, debt crisis, and ne negative impact on investors are some of the effects of this administration's failed policies. The economic crisis has significantly impacted workers and citizens generally. Unemployment rates, particularly amongst the young people, have risen to their highest in recent memory, making it difficult for many to find stable and decent paying jobs. Inflation and exchange rate volatility have eroded workers' purchasing power and have pushed many beyond the poverty line, below the poverty line. The healthcare and education sectors have also been negatively affected with inadequate funding and deteriorating quality of services. Our economy is plagued by high public debt levels, which hinder investments in social and economic development projects. And I give you for example, in 2016, if you shared the public debt of 120 billion among 30 million Ghanaians, each Ghanaian owed 4,000 Ghana cities. Today, if you divide the debt of 577 billion by 30 million Ghanaians, all of us sitting here owe 19,000 cities. This coupled with a relatively high un unemployment rate, particularly amongst the youth, exacerbates the challenges faced by our citizens. Inflation and exchange rate volatility further erode workers' purchasing power, as I said. For the first time in over 50 years, we have defaulted in payment of our debts, and we've been downgraded by credit rating, rating agencies to the lowest level ever experienced, junk, in other words, baller status. The escalating cost of living driven by hyperinflation, a collapsing currency, and rising prices of essential items, including food, has made life unbear unbearable for millions of Ghanaian households who are currently practicing the 001 or 010 or 1. Zero, zero formula. For those of you who, who know it, you know it. <laughs> Due to the government's debt restructuring program, the working and middle classes face the greatest threat to their livelihoods. The debt exchange has expropriated the interest payments on bonds held by the working and middle classes, affecting many households including poor pensioners. The poor who are dependent on the working and middle class also now face an uncertain future. According to the World Bank, 
Inflation has pushed as many as 850,000 Ghanaians into poverty in the past one year alone. Unemployment amongst young people in Ghana has skyrocketed and is estimated today to stand at 13 percent. The consequences of this economic catastrophe have affected every sector of our national life, particularly education, health and infrastructure. Unfortunately, the government has no grasp of the magnitude of the economic suffering that Ghanaians are going through and is unwilling to make the necessary adjustments to resolve it. They also appear unprepared to improve the general governance of the country and end corruption, nepotism, politicization, and the weakening of state institutions. They are oblivious to our country's failing state of education and health care and remain fixated on poorly implemented programs that have thrown the sectors into crisis. We also have a president who has run out of ideas on how to solve the economic challenges we find ourselves in. And by his recent declaration, his focus and last energies are going to be expended on installing his anointed successor as the next president. Comrades, we could have avoided this unpleasant situation. The signs of this crisis were there for all to see. A conflicted finance minister whose only interest was to borrow endlessly and mar our economy in the quagmire of debt was obvious from as far back as 2019. We could see it coming. A president whose budget was creatively crafted to hide huge liabilities in order to present a favorable economic outturn to the world so that he could borrow more from the international capital market was evident for all to see. Appointment of family and friends into various positions in government, brazen interference to obstruct the fight against corruption, reckless abuse of the public purse, arrogance and, the, and luxury in the conduct of public officers have all been characteristic of this administration since its inception in 2017. It didn't start today. But comrades, it is regrettable for me to note that at such a crucial time in our nation's life, society's moral voice refused to speak up against these unfortunate developments in our democratic governance. NDC was left alone as the solitary voice seeking to hold the government accountable and speaking up for the voiceless Ghanaians. And we were often cast out as spoiled brats who were ranting just because we had lost power. Today, the chickens have come home to roost. And we are all affected. As he said, country broke, country no broke, we all did inside. There must be an end to this decline and a restoration of stability to the economy so that Ghana citizens and working people can breathe a sigh of relief and not have their already inadequate incomes eroded further by inflationary pressures. In the last few years, I have been outlining policies that a future NDC government will implement, and the aim is to stop the steep decline in the economy, turn it around, and stabilize it. I've also shared my position on governance and institutional reforms to ensure our country is reset and built into the Ghana we all want. It is important to know that we in the NDC will not be couching propagandist slogans and passing them off as policy. We have much to learn as a country from the disaster that has unfolded before our very eyes when sections of our population became so enamored with empty slogans and acronyms. We will focus on substantial government issues to get the job done in a no thrills, no frills manner. We will cut out the rigmarole 
and deliver realistic policies to impact our economy and our country positively. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, the NDC proposes a series of transition measures to address the economic decline and set Ghana on the path to recovery. These measures include reducing the public debt by placing a moratorium on non-concessional borrowing, actively seeking concessional financing and grants, and reviewing legislation to limit the non-core activities of some state-owned enterprises. Why must we reduce our debt obligations? Because we need to do so to create fiscal adequ uh, 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 adequate fiscal space to stabilize the economy and provide social services. So to achieve this, the NDC will implement, amongst others, the following measures. One, as I said, place an immediate moratorium on all non-concessional borrowing. Two, pursue our bilateral partners and multilateral partners for more concessional financing and grants. Three, implement infrastructure projects that are self-financing and not a burden on the public debt. Four, limit the central bank's financing of government, as we did in, as we did in 2016. Zero central bank financing of government. And also reform the Bank of Ghana. Five, tighten legislation to put a cap on debt accumulation and prevent any future reckless finance minister from borrowing, as has been witnessed under this administration. So you put a cap so that some rogue finance minister won't come in future and run up the debt again. And so if we say the debt must be 60% of GDP, at each, every year you must calculate and make sure that you are under 60% of GDP. If the finance minister exceeds it, he will be sanctioned. Sanctioned? Uh, sacked. <laughs> I meant sacked. <laughs> Re-establish the sinking fund to smoothen out our debt repayment obligations. So when we're in government, we set up a sinking fund to which we committed some of our oil revenues and other revenues so that any debts that were due, we had money to pay. Unfortunately, when this government came, they depleted the sinking fund and left it empty with no buffers to cover themselves. We will stop the collateralization of statutory funds like the GET Fund and the District Assembly's Common Fund. We will review some legislations to limit the financial implications of non-core activities of some state-owned enterprises like the Ghana Cocoa Board and the GMPC. Additionally, we aim to reduce the size and cost of government, tackle corruption, and enforce stricter financial management regulations and gu guidelines. To this effect, we will reduce the number of ministers and appointees. We will merge ministerial portfolios to prune down the number of ministries dr drastically. For instance, I don't see why we have aviation ministry, railways ministry, transport ministry, uh, and all, all the other ministries. <laughs> Sanitation ministry, local government ministry, business development ministry, We will reduce waste and cost overruns, institutional borrowing and breaches in public procurement rules. We will ensure compliance with internal and external financial control systems. We will review and I'm sure, uh, let, let me let Gen Secretary General sit down. We will review and eliminate ex gratia in its current form. That's why I wanted you to sit down. <laughs> Comrades and friends, we will recalibrate and amalgamate duplicated state agencies. In some cases, there are state agencies doing the same thing. We'll put them together. 
We will discontinue the payment of utility bills, fuel, DSTV, etc., as part of top government employee service conditions. The recent misuse of public funds by government officials demands more creative and stricter measures to prevent further financial losses. Therefore, we will introduce stricter financial management regulations and guidelines to prevent the over 17 billion Ghana cities that is lost in annual financial irregularities. We will also safeguard the principle of value for money in public procurement by establishing an independent value for money office that will vet any project above a specified ceiling approved by Parliament. We will com continue with the implementation of the process of constitutional review in order to strengthen the 1992 Constitution and bring it up to speed with current trends and development. As you all know, this was begun by Professor John Ivan Sata Mills. Um, in 2015, somebody took us to court, and the case was not adjudicated till we were almost in the election year. And so we couldn't continue with it, and we left it to the next uh, administration, and it has stalled. Stabilizing the city is another crucial measure to redirect billions of dollars spent on imports towards domestic production. We are not going to claim that we've arrested it and giving the key to the IGP. But we're going to work to stabilize the city by eliminating a lot of the wasteful imports that we have a comparative advantage to produce. We'll incentivize the indigenous private sector to capture the commanding heights of the economy in every sector to reduce financial outflows occasioned by huge profit rep repatriations by international companies. We will pass local content laws to give Ghanaian registered businesses an advantage, especially in the extractive sector. By incentivizing local production of goods and promoting value addition, we can stabilize the city, create sustainable jobs, and achieve food self-sufficiency. The businesses will be incentivized to produce goods such as rice, sugar, tomato, frozen fish, poultry, meat products, vegetable cooking oils, and local pharmaceuticals. We will place restrictions on unbridled, unbridled importation of some highly consumed goods through the use of tariffs and non-tariff barriers measures. This policy will also support large-scale commercial agricultural production to enable us to achieve food self-sufficiency. A strong cooperative system, and this is where we failed over the years, we have not taken advantage of cooperatives because it's easier to reach the farmers and other people through cooperatives when they are working together than to reach them as individual farmers. And so a strong cooperative system in the agricultural sector based on farmer service centers is going to be the vehicle that will drive our agricultural credits and input supply system. <laughs> Ghana has 16 regions. Each of the 16 regions of this country is going to be supported with investments in products for which they have a comparative advantage. Processing plants will be provided in the regions for processing of crops such as palm oil, groundnuts, cotton, coffee, cocoa, soya, cassava, cereals, ginger and spices, cut flowers, fruits, and other horticultural products. Cashew, cashew. Cashew, cashew is there. Cashew is there. It was number two. The man is from Bronga Alpha, so. <laughs> For his benefit, let me go over it again. <laughs> Palm, cashew, granuts, cotton, coffee, 
cocoa, soya, cassava, cereals, ginger, spices, cut flowers, fruits, and other horticultural products. Somebody shout a share now. You're right. We will involve the private sector in our national food buffer stock arrangements to improve efficiency and cut out waste. We will rehabilitate and preserve our remaining forest reserves through revenues received from carbon offsets. Hundreds of thousands of jobs will be created this way in the forestry sector. We also intend to strengthen accountability in our gold export industry and promote an integrated bauxite and alumina industry to increase returns from the extractive sector. It is widely known and acknowledged that the figures we capture as our gold exports are far lower than the quantity of the metal that leaves our shores. Implementing better accountability in this gold mining sector and gold export sector can yield billions of dollars for this country. We will prioritize value addition by increasing domestic processing and refining of our gold before export and will continue to pursue the dream of establishing an integrated bauxite and alumina industry. Brother Secretary General, I make you a firm pledge that we will work together and lead a team to revamp and reignite some strategic industries. You mentioned some of them. Tor is one. Bost is another. Valco is another. Industries like that, we would work to revitalize them. And I agree with you when you say that it's not only the private sector that can run industry. The government and public states too can run industry. And we proved it in our time. When we were in office, Tor was working. Boss was working and making profits. The state enterprises were working. We said that we revived the uh, uh, Kumasi shoe factory. And so these are things that can work and we'll continue to look at them. In this green transition period, we will partner with our multinational partners such as Talo, ENI, ACA, and others who are active in our upstream oil industry to speed up and bring into operation more oil and gas fields that have needlessly been delayed under this government. This will generate extra revenue to enable us to stabilize the economy. We will explore a partnership under PPP arrangements between the ECG and some serious private sector organizations in the downstream distribution uh, sector. The private sector participation would assist each ECG in distribution of prepaid meters and collection of bills. We will rationalize the power sector and develop strategies to bring down the cost of power. We will also accelerate the integration of solar energy into our transmission grid. Once we halt the decline, and then here we intend to remove taxes on solar equipment to make them cheaper for Ghanaians to procure. <laughs> Once we hold the decline of the economy, we will begin to witness the full impact of our policies towards achieving our goal of building the Ghana we want together. We will update the 40-year development plan and continue with its implementation. The NDC's vision for building the Ghana we want is centered around the five pillars of the 40-year development framework which we formulated before we left office in 2016. And that is one, build an industrialized, inclusive and resilient economy. Two, creating an equitable, healthy and prosperous nation. Three, developing well-planned, safe communities while protecting the natural environment. Four, building effect effective, efficient and dynamic institutions for national development. And five, strengthening Ghana's role in Africa and international affairs. Our policies will align with these pillars and we welcome input and collaboration from the TUC and our other allies. In addition to the above, I'd like to highlight some significant sectoral and sub-sectoral policies 
that we intend to implement to further our agenda for building the Ghana we want. Our commitment to the public sector will involve improving its role as a service provider and provider of jobs. Therefore, we will review and reposition all public sector organizations, promote innovation, improve services and management. Additionally, we will implement new strategies to establish key performance indicators, making state agencies efficient, effective and productive. Appointments to state-owned enterprises will be merit-driven and not based on whether you are the friend or family of the president. And more importantly, we will protect workers' rights to join a union. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that musical interlude. <laughs> Let me hit that point again. And more importantly, we will protect workers' rights to join a union. <laughs> Boy. Thank you. And, <laughs> and protect their collective bargaining rights, work safely, and free from harassment. Our commitment to social democratic principles means that we will work to make workers receive fair wages and benefits, be treated with dignity at work, and have fair and equal opportunities for training and promotion. We will also provide other forms of support as provided for under pieces of legislation related to work safety and workmen's compensation. We will negotiate wages fairly and transparently and consider inflation and other cost of living indices. Our focus when it comes to creating decent jobs will be the promotion of public and private partnerships in the construction and manufacturing uh, 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 sectors, agriculture, forestry and fishery industries. We will, con we will establish national employment centers in order to uh, create an avenue for youth employment. And we will incentivize businesses that pick or recruit from the National Employment Center database. They will get tax breaks for employing people from the databases. <laughs> During COVID, we recommended that at times where workers lose their jobs and are un unemployed, it should be possible for there to be a scheme where part of their social security savings is paid to them as allowances until they can find another job. And we suggested it, but um, it fell on deaf, deaf ears. Don't sing again, I beg you. <laughs> we intend to implement 
a 24-hour economy. And by this, we will provide incentives in, in, in terms of reduction in corporate taxes and other exemptions to businesses that will sign up to the 24-hour economy initiative. And if we remember, in the past, but then we must also look at the security side and make sure that we provide them with security. Because if you remember, in the past, filling stations used to work 24 hours. Unfortunately, armed robbers started attacking them, and because of that, they all closed at about 10 o'clock. And so if we're able to provide them with adequate security, businesses and services like that, there's no reason why they can't operate 24 hours, and we'll give them the tax incentives to be able to do so. We'll identify and promote strategic growth areas such as IT with a targeted $3 billion investment and drive an aggressive infrastructure development under our Big Push program. We will shift attention from the macro economy to the micro and focus on growth in the real sector instead of just on macroeconomic stability. Additionally, we'll support the TUC and organized labor to expand its current investments and establish new joint businesses and ventures with third parties to also provide employment to our people. And you can see organizations like Quality Insurance, which are established by labor, uh, uh, this thing. I'm sure there are more places where labor can invest its resources. As far it should not only uh, exist for people to establish uh, industries and go and unionize. You should also establish <laughs> industries and have unions formed against you, the employer, yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As part of our industrial policy, we will develop policies that promote Ghanaian ownership and control of major sectors and encourage a buy Ghana agenda. The NDC government, in partnership with organized labor, the metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies, and the private sector, will implement a social housing scheme that will enable working people to own houses in any district of their choice in their lifetime. We will remove the cap that diverts monies generated by the National Health Insurance Levy into the consolidated fund so that the NHIS can receive its full amount of money so that it can pay its service providers and uh, deliver better quality service. Within the first 100 days of coming into office, we'll, conf we'll convene a stakeholder summit that brings together educationists, experts, teachers, parents, students, and opinion leaders to deliberate on how to improve the implementation of the free SHS system and also improve the quality of our basic education because that's where it all begins. We will return Ghana to the regional exams conducted by the West African Examinations Council so that it will be possible to compare the performance of our children with our English-speaking neighbors in the sub-region. Right now, we write a local Ghana exam. We mark it ourselves. We mark our own script, and we give ourselves high marks, and we tickle ourselves, and we are laughing that uh, 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 things are improving. If you don't have any benchmark to compare, how can you tell you are improving? We will promote sports, tourism, and the creative arts as avenues of job creation. We will incentivize the service sector to promote its fast growth and its contribution to GDP. We will roll out 5G, that's the fifth generation, and create a strong digital infrastructure to optimize new technologies, including artificial intelligence. We will invest in technical skills training and we started this by the establishment of the technical universities so that students could go and opt to do the HND or do a degree program in the technical universities. We need to equip our young people 
with skills for the world of work. We are talking about young people who cross the desert and go to Europe to work. Those who have skills as masons, you know, uh, carpenters and things, find work very quickly. It's not as easy for, as those who don't have skills. They have to struggle a while before they can find jobs. But if you're a welder, you're a carpenter, you're a mason, those people get jobs very quickly. Plumbers and others, electricians, they get jobs very quickly. Collaboration between NDC and the TUC is essential for achieving better economic growth, improved working conditions, and overall well-being of Ghanaians. Oh no, I, I think I've left this out. Improve access to water and sanitation. That one is obvious. These ones I'll just read quickly. Invest in the transport sector, roads, highways, aviation, maritime, railway. Provide equipment to our security services, police, army, prisons, fire, immigration. Especially provide the police with bulletproof vests and armored vehicles in order to help them in the fight against violent crime. We give them ordinary vehicles, they go to confront our robbers and they shoot and kill them. As a social democratic party, we believe in balancing economic prosperity with the well-being of workers and promoting equality. We will engage in an annual governance dialogue with organized labor groups, CSOs, and other recognized groups. Once a year, we'll have a governance summit. We'll sit together and see if we're making progress in our governance. You'll all be there to mark us and see whether we're doing well or we're not doing well. And as I announced already, we'll set up a governance advisory committee which will release every year the state of governance reports in Ghana. And we'll use that as a basis to make corrections if we are going off the path. And finally, we aim to expand economic freedom primarily through thriving small enterprises, development initiatives at the district assembly levels, and cooperative schemes. Cooperative is going to be a central plank in our policy for assisting small businesses, as well as through our natural resource sectors and manufacturing. This approach will promote economic growth and avoid concentrating power control and capital in the hands of a few large corporations. Comrade Secretary General, Comrade Chairman, and officials of the TUC of Ghana, I want to thank you so much and your team for your patience in welcoming and listening to us. We don't intend this to be a one-time engagement. We understand that through the ambit of the Building Ghana Tour, this will be an ongoing process, which you recall we started before our 2020 manifesto, to fully build the trust and confidence of our social democratic family to achieve our shared aspirations for Ghana, its workers, and its people. Comrades, let's work together, let's win together, let's progress together in building